All right, welcome folks. I can see quite a few of you are starting to stroll into the webinar today. Um, we're gonna get started in just a minute. Give you a chance to, to log in here. <clears throat> As we go throughout the presentation today, it will be recorded um, and it will be uh, available on our YouTube channel um, following completion today, probably in the next week or so. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and type them into the Q&A box and we will get to them um, at the end of the presentation. Again, welcome everyone. I see some familiar names uh, in the attendee list. So I won't spend too much time giving you all the introduction this morning, but we've got about another minute. We'll let people uh, continue to log in here. <laughs> oh, appreciate that. That's so nice. It's kind words. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, it's one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, if you're joining us a little bit late, we'll go ahead and um, uh, have this recording available for you after the fact on our YouTube channel. My name is Alyssa Vinson. I'm the residential horticulture agent here at the Manatee County Extension Office. And I just want to take a quick opportunity to talk to you very briefly at the beginning of our program about who we are as Extension if you're not familiar with us. Um, we are a function of the University of Florida, uh, which is a land grant university. And our mission within UF IFAS is to enhance the quality of life for for people in our community. And we do this through um, really taking the information that is um, gleaned through research at the University of Florida, as well as other educational institutions throughout the world, and distilling it and making it relevant and applicable for your everyday lives. Um, and so we are here to serve um, our community members, and we do that in a variety of different ways. As I said, I'm in the residential horticulture program. I manage Florida-friendly landscaping, the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. We have a Master Naturalist Program that I manage. And then we have other associated programs related to landscapes and, and um, uh, landscape ecology. We have commercial horticulture that deals with our landscape industry. So those are folks that are um, professionals in the landscape industry. We have a commercial fisheries um, and marine resources agent. We have a livestock agent. We have folks who focus specifically on food and nutrition. We have folks that are working um, diligently with youth throughout the community through our 4-H program as well as throughout all of our programs. And so I like to start just by highlighting some of our impacts to Manatee County. Um, these are our 2019 impacts. You can see we had over $1.4 million of value to CEUs um, for pesticide license holders in Manatee County, over $860,000 of value in volunteer time. And that really is thanks in um, great part to our Master Gardener volunteers who donate over 10,000 hours of time um, annually here in Manatee County. We had over 28,000 youth educated through 4-H programs, as well as 14 millions of gallons of water saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. And that's through various water conservation programs that we have in the office. And so I do like to just show you um, that we are here. We are ready to help. And please reach out to us um, when you have uh, issues in your home landscape or in any other area of your life, because we really do touch on all areas. 
Today you're going to hear from Mac Lessig, who is our um, community gardens uh, coordinator here at the Manatee County Extension Office. He also happens to be a Master Gardener volunteer, so he's participating in this program as, um, as part of that volunteer program. And so we're happy to have Mac talk to us today. Mac, I'll let you go ahead and share your screen and get started. All right, all right. So y'all will have to pardon me while we change some things over. All right. Are we good? Can y'all see the slide okay? Looks great. All right, cool. So like Alyssa said, my name is Mac Lessig. I'm the community, uh, community Gardens Program Assistant for Manatee County. I also help with school gardens as well. My program is designed to provide development and support services to those community and school gardens through education and support, um, grant writing, tutorials, uh, horticultural skills, all that fun stuff uh, that we take for granted as far as gardeners go. Um, I help to supply those to people who are learning or want to build a more communal type garden. <laughs> So today we're here learning about garden maintenance. Last week y'all learned about planning your garden, if I'm correct. So today we're going to be learning about caring for that garden. Um, we do have some objectives. So if you've ever taken any of my workshops or in-person classes pre-COVID, I used to test a lot. So I have these objectives. I don't know that we're going to be testing in this one today. Alyssa, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. But Normally I would, but our objectives today, we're going to develop some useful gardening techniques and strategies. We're gonna understand some normal garden maintenance things to consider. Some of them may be overlooked. In fact, a lot of times in a community garden setting, these are commonly overlooked and they are the cause of poor production and poor plant health. And then we're gonna learn a little bit about some pest and disease management, but I'm going to leave the bulk of that for next week's presentation, which is Kathy Oliver. So the first skill everyone must know when gardening is watering, and I know that sounds commonsensical, but it's one of the most commonly overlooked maintenance functions in a garden. Watering is critical for healthy plants, right? We know that from kindergarten till adulthood that plants require water. And without water, they can't perform any of their normal functions. And that includes fruit production and flower production. So in our gardens, watering must be consistent. Okay, I have to stress that it's consistent. If you can create a schedule, that will save you a lot of trouble uh, as far as keeping your plants nice and healthy. Ideally, you wanna water between six and 8 a.m. But if you're not a morning person or anything like that, uh, you can water later in the afternoon if you must. However, the later in the day that you water, the longer that that water will sit on those leaves and on those fruits, and the more opportunities are given for diseases uh, and pests to show up. So watering in the morning allows for those water droplets and puddles to evaporate and the plant to dry off before the nighttime when that water would just sit and create that ideal environment for fungal and bacterial pathogens. There are different strategies for watering your garden. My personal favorite approach is hand watering, and I know that's not practical for everyone. However, in a community garden setting or in a school garden setting, it's one of those irrigation methods that I encourage because it makes you go into the garden, which again is one of those overlooked maintenance things is actually being present in your garden to check on your plants to make sure everything looks normal. But you can also use micro irrigation. In particular, uh, micros called bubblers or soaker hoses are very uh, useful. They're very efficient with water. And it doesn't leave that wet leaf surface that an overhead irrigation would do. Now, overhead irrigation can also include rain. And as y'all know, the last couple of days, it's been pretty rainy. We don't have any control over that. And so you might see an uptick in some fungal or bacterial pathogens on the leaves of your vegetables if you plant it already because of the rain. But if you can help it, or with the things that we can control, micro irrigation, in particular bubblers and soaker hoses, don't allow for water to sit on the leaf surface. 
During the growing season, your garden should receive about an inch of water a week. Um, an easy way to measure that, if you like, is to take an old tuna can and whatever your, if you have an irrigation system, you can run it and see if those tuna cans fill up and then you can measure the amount of water that was delivered during that irrigation session. Throughout the week, if it adds up to an inch, you're watering sufficiently for your vegetable garden. If you're hand watering, it's a little trickier. Um, if you've used the tuna can method, I bet you're gonna aim at the tuna can and fill it up. So it's not as practical. But as long as you're consistent with your hand watering, so let's say three to four times a week, you should be getting at least an inch um, through that method as well. And then you always wanna check too before you're watering. Um, all the soils are different depending on where you live. Some people have heavier soils. If you live in Lakewood Ranch or out east where they're doing a lot of development, you're gonna be dealing with fill soil. If you're living closer to, let's say the islands or in West Bradenton, you're gonna have uh, gray sand so it dries quickly. But the rule of thumb, no pun intended, is to stick your finger into the soil and within that first half inch, so your first digit or two, if you're feeling moisture, wait, okay? Once that half inch is dry, so if you stick your finger in the soil and it's dry, you don't feel any moisture anymore, then water again. Okay, but watering again is super important. One of the most commonly overlooked things when it comes to plants, you can over and under. You wanna try and avoid those extremes. Okay, try and find that happy medium and be consistent. The next, and this one really, uh, sometimes people get intimidated by fertilizer. Uh, it shouldn't be anything that y'all should be afraid of. Um, it is something that requires knowledge and it requires um, experience to really get confident with it, but it's necessary for vegetable production. The plants that we've selected for, are hungry all the time for water and for nutrients. And Floridian soils, if you didn't know, typically are very poor in nutrients. And so they don't naturally supply the optimal amount of nutrients for those vegetables to really be productive. And so fertilizer, again, is necessary, regardless of your philosophy. Okay, if you're organic, that's fine. If you don't mind using conventional fertilizers, that's fine. Whatever floats your boat, it needs to be done and it needs to be done routinely. Okay, so this is just as consistent as your watering, just less frequently. Okay, so you'll have on your schedule your watering three to four times a week if you're hand, ugh, hand watering. But if you're fertilizing, it's gonna be like every two weeks, somewhere in that ballpark, depending on your product. Either method is valid though. In Manatee County, I'm sure y'all are aware of our fertilizer ordinance. Vegetable gardens are exempt from this ordinance. Okay, so if you're growing vegetables or edibles, you can use these fertilizers that would normally be banned during the ordinance. When you're considering fertilizers, conventional is easy. I mean, that's the general all-purpose kind of miracle grow, if you will, of fertilizers. Those tend to be well-balanced and they're cheap. We'll say that, where they're inexpensive. Organic fertilizers are one of those hot topics as of late, and I've had a lot of inquiries about them. And so I thought that I might explain a couple to you. Um, here's a little list of what could be considered an organic fertilizer. Know that it's not an exhaustive list but it's kind of uh, the main categories that you'll see. So there are compost and composted manures. These could be used as kind of like your general soil additive and really low intensity fertilizer. You can use blood meal, which is a high nitrogen, really good for leafy crops. You can use bone meal that has a high phosphorus and calcium, good for root crops. You can use seaweed and fish fertilizers, crab and shrimp, alfalfa meal. Those are all really interesting mixes, sustainable alternatives that you can use as fertilizers. And then of course there are organic mixes. So just normal blends. And there are three brands that you're likely to encounter. I'm not endorsing them. They're just, when you go to the store, you'll see them. They're gonna see um, Espoma, Job's, Dr. Earth, 
There's miracle Grow Organics now. Those would be considered those organic mixes. They're gonna have this list all in one product, okay? And so they're well balanced. One thing to consider though, when you're using these fertilizers, again, because they're so crucial to our plant growth, is you'll look at this label on the back and you'll be like, what the heck? What is all this stuff, okay? You will see terms like water soluble or water insoluble nitrogen, and those have different impacts on the plants. So water soluble fertilizers are ones that can be dissolved into water, into a solution, and they are considered quick. So they provide quote unquote immediate nutrition. Okay, so if your, your plants are suffering, let's say from a nitrogen deficiency, and you want a quick improvement, you want to help it out, you would use a quick release or a water soluble nitrogen source. Okay, water insoluble fertilizers do not dissolve into solution. Okay, so they are considered slow release because they take time to break down, either through a uh, an artificial shell like an osmocote or through microbial activity, those things require time to be released. And those are good for like a longer season feed. So if you wanna feed them continuously throughout the season, using water insoluble fertilizers is a way to do that. Now looking at this label, and I don't wanna go into too much detail about fertilizer labels, cause that could be its own course but you can see that there's three kinds of nitrogen here. There's ammoniacal, and that is a combination of two forms of nitrogen. There's water soluble, like we talked about. So 1.6% of our nitrogen in here will be quick release. And then 3% falls into our water insoluble. And so this is partially quick, but it also feeds for a longer time too. Okay, so those are the two main differences you'll see on your um, nitrogen content. The rest of your nutrients are, are pretty basic. I mean, you can see where the phosphate is, you can see the potassium, calcium. There's no craziness about it being soluble or not, except for your magnesium down here. So this are slow and quick. This again comes with your confidence and your experience, and all those skills that you'll be building through time. However, just a quick reference. If you're growing leafy crops, so that would be like your collards, kale, lettuces, broccoli even, those plants typically require more nitrogen. And nitrogen is associated with vegetative growth on plants. And so those are going to be producing leaves for you to consume. And so they require a great deal of nitrogen to continually produce leaves. Legumes, which are beans and peas, typically in a garden setting, need less nitrogen. And if you're not aware, they do have the ability to fix nitrogen by themselves through an association with beneficial bacteria. And so applying less nitrogen is beneficial to them because they don't need that excess. In fact, if you give beans too much nitrogen, so you're fertilizing them the same way you would fertilize your lettuce, you're going to have really leafy bean plants, but poor pod production, poor bean production. Your root and fruit crops, so that would be like your potatoes, that would be your onions, that would be your tomatoes, squashes, zucchinis, they all benefit from more potassium in their fertilizer, okay? In particular, when they're setting flowers or fruits. So in their initial growth stages as seedlings, you can use a high nitrogen fertilizer to boost their vegetative growth. Once they start to reach maturity, once they begin flowering, then you switch a fertilizer to something that contains more potassium and phosphorus too, and calcium. Those will give you better quality fruits. A little bit about nutrient deficiencies. And so as homeowners and residential gardeners, and, and a lot of y'all might be novice gardeners, nutritional deficiencies can be challenging, even for professionals. Um, there are some very basic ones that can be diagnosed, but there are others that you are not expected to know. <laughs> even when you bring them into extension, it may take us um, sending that sample off to determine that particular deficiency if it's something that would be unusual. 
but for your main nutrient deficiencies, so for those major nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, there are some really diagnostic symptoms for a homeowner or a community gardener that may help you in determining the right type of fertilizer to use or the right course of action when it comes to that. So with nitrogen, you're typically seeing a general yellowing of the plant initially. So instead of that nice deep green, you're starting to get this weird lime green color. And it'll start with some of the older leaves, but as that deficiency gets worse or becomes more severe, the entire plant will have some weird yellow hue to it. Okay, that would be a nitrogen. Phosphorus is typically associated with a red or purple color on the leaves. And you will see this a lot with tomatoes. So if you're growing tomatoes this season and there hasn't been any frost yet, because that can also cause it. But if there's no frost and you're just normally growing and you're not fertilizing, you'll start to see this kind of purplish red tinge to the leaves. And that's signaling to you that those plants are hungry for phosphorus. Just side note, tomatoes are beasts, okay, y'all? They love to eat. They like a lot of nutrition, highly fertile soils. And so this is one of the more common ones you'll see, nitrogen and phosphorus. Magnesium tends to be associated with some yellowing as well because it's the major component of chlorophyll. So the part that makes the leaves green and produces photosynthesis. So if you're having a magnesium deficiency, you'll start to see um, some green venation with yellowing. That can be cured through Epsom salts, okay, used in moderation. That's just a magnesium sulfate dissociates in water and then you can fix that. And then lastly, for our major deficiencies is potassium. And a lot of times you see that with leaf scorch on the edges. So you start to see these brown or necrotic or dead leaf edges or margins. A lot of times that's associated with potassium. These are less common. So I'm not going to go through all of these with you, okay? Um, iron probably would be one of those ones you're, you might encounter and calcium too. Calcium is very important. Um, in fact, it's a secondary nutrient, so it's not even really considered a micro. It's, it's really important for the development of the plant, um, for their immune system, for their health, and their structure, and for the quality of your fruits. And so if you can help it, having a fertilizer that incorporates a calcium component is very beneficial to vegetable production. Iron, um, you'll see sometimes as well, and that's typically um, in high pH soils. And so if you're growing, let's say on the island or you've had your soil tested and it's a high pH, um, it's alkaline, you'll start to see some iron deficiency. And that has something called intervenal chlorosis, which is uh, really distinct green veins. And then you'll see some yellowing as well. But it went in doubt bring it to us and we'll walk you through all of these things here. If it's something that we can't help you with in the office, we will recommend that you send that sample off for testing. Another part of maintenance is weeding. Um, I know that sounds kind of silly, but in my job, I see a lot of things. So <laughs> weeding gets overlooked frequently. Um, know that weeds are primary competitors for your vegetables. And so they're stealing their water and they're stealing all their nutrients. And so they must be managed, um, especially for seedlings. If you're, if you're planting by directly sowing seeds or you're using transplants and you're not maintaining weeds around those plants, they're being outcompeted for everything. And you're gonna start to see some stunting and nutrient deficiencies. But one thing people might not know is that weeds are excellent at harboring pests and plant diseases. And so in a lot of cases, they serve as alternate hosts. So when we're not growing a particular crop, that disease or pest will go and live on those weed species that aren't being managed. And then when you begin to grow that crop that's susceptible, those diseases and pests can make their way back into your garden. Okay, I'll use the word, uh, the weed pigweed. Have y'all ever seen pigweed? It's kind of spiky and weird looking. Pigweed can harbor several viruses that can be transmitted back into tomatoes, for instance. And so if they're not managed, they serve as an alternate host for white flies, and those white flies will come back into your garden and then transmit viruses to your tomatoes. So again, not, they're, just not, they're not just competitors. They're not just stealing, but they're 
inviting bad things to your garden. Okay, so weeds always must be managed. Um, you can handpick them. That's my preferred method. None of them should be large enough to where you have to dig them out. <laughs> That's just, you've waited too long there. <laughs> um, so you want to keep them as small as possible um, for ease of picking. And then when you're done picking them, don't just throw them into the garden. I know a lot of people like the chop and, chop and drop method when it comes to landscape maintenance. And in some instances that can be beneficial. Let's say you're building a food forest or you have like a forested area, chop and drop can work. That's when you're pulling or chopping something and then just throwing it back on the ground. In a vegetable garden, that's not really appropriate because fungal and bacterial pathogens can grow on those weed de or debris piles and then come back into your garden. So even though you've managed the weeds, if you've not removed them from the situation, you can still have diseases and pests that are associated with them. Mulching, eh. Um, I don't want to say that this gets overlooked a lot. I know we kind of talk y'all to death about mulching, but in a vegetable garden, it's, it's the same principle. Um, you may want to use a different mulch. Don't use red mulch in, in the vegetable garden. That's just, that's my preference. I'm not a red mulch fan. Um, it's bulky. It has an artificial dye in it. Do you want that on your lettuce? Just saying. In a vegetable garden, we'll use straw. Okay, so straw can come from a farm, you can buy it in the store, you can meet with your friends and go get some straw, um, you can buy pine straw from certain nurseries now. Those are all acceptable mulches in a vegetable garden because they can be removed easily, okay? A lot of times they won't necessarily have a lot of weeds with them, but do anticipate some. Um, and then as they begin to break down, they become incorporated into your soil as well. So they become part of the organic material that helps your plants grow. Um, mulch is very beneficial because it helps to reduce the temperature in the soil around the root zone, which allows for better absorption of water. So it makes the water use more efficient, okay? And it also helps to prevent evaporation. But to be effective, it needs to be about two to three inches. So if you're just going and sprinkling a couple little hay particles here and there and saying that your vegetable garden's mulched, it's not, okay? So two to three inches is really what's effective at reducing those soil temperatures and helping to reduce the evaporation potential as well, thereby making your watering more efficient. So if you can't do that three to four, visits to the garden every day or every week to water, maybe invest in some mulch. So we use it in our landscapes all the time, but in our vegetable gardens, it's one of those things like, eh, we don't mulch vegetable gardens, but you should, okay? Bare soil is unhappy soil. It should be covered, preferably with something living, but if you don't wanna have a cover crop, which we'll talk about later, you can use mulch. So harvesting is again, uh, one of those maintenance things. They're in here for a reason, folks. Um, grow, when you grow things, pick it. Don't waste all that time and energy and money and all that, all that stuff to grow something and then to just let it rot on the plant. Um, for, for several reasons, that just is not a good idea. Um, one that you might not think about is that those overripe or unharvested fruits and vegetables tend to attract pests. Uh, first, you get the insect kinds. So you get leaf-footed bugs and stink bugs that will come and feast on your unpicked tomatoes. But if those persist, you start to get visitors of the mammalian nature, okay? So you start to get uh, raccoons and rats will start to show up to feast on your stuff that's not harvested. Sometimes you'll even get the the occasional human that comes in to take your stuff. They've been eyeing those tomatoes and you've not come to pick them in a week. So they're making an assumption that you don't want them and they take them, okay? But also they those rotting, so once they begin to rot, they serve as a place for diseases again. And in Florida, plant diseases can be uh, super problematic. I mean, they can really determine how successful you are at at all in a vegetable garden. And those rotting fruits 
are good places for certain fungal and bacterial pathogens to start growing. They, they start to reproduce and then they begin to spread to healthy tissue and other plants. And then you've got this epidemic that started from a rotten tomato, for instance. So always pick your stuff, okay? When you're harvesting, please bring a pair of shears or clippers, okay, to safely harvest the, the produce, okay? Don't just go out there and yank all the tomatoes off. That poor plant, you've broken the, all the branches off it to get a tomato. Use the shears to nicely cut, <laughs> okay? Nicely cut each fruit off so you're limiting that wound because each, each cut, each damage you do to the plant is a wound, just like how we get a cut and that wound is open for infection. The same principle applies to our plants. If you're just pulling things off, you're potentially breaking branches, you're ripping some of the, the bark, quote unquote, off the tomato, and you're exposing that part of the stem to disease. So using the shears is a good way to do that or to prevent that. And between each cut, you should be sanitizing those shears. So you should have some rubbing alcohol with you or yeah, rubbing alcohol or a flame, not a flamethrower, just like a lighter, nothing crazy. You don't need to burn your forest down or anything like that. Just a lighter and some rubbing alcohol. You can dip your blades in the rubbing alcohol and then flame them, okay? That will destroy any viruses that might be present as well. Um, and then you make your next cut. Okay, it's, it's particularly important when you're doing that between two individual plants. Okay, so sanitation is key. Here we're going to talk a little bit about gardening techniques. So this is my backyard. Isn't it lovely? Just kidding, y'all. This is Florida. It's not going to look like that. I'm just saying. But it's a nice way to grow beans, for instance. So that's one technique is trellising and staking, for instance. But before you do that, you have to consider the design of your garden. And this is a very subjective topic because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, your garden won't look like my garden and the beauty of my garden is different than the beauty of your garden. But there are some, some basic principles that should be incorporated into a vegetable garden. Ideally, your garden rows or plots should be oriented north to south, okay? So that helps them get the most amount of sun possible. It helps to reduce the impacts of shading. So if you can imagine the sun rises in the east and moves across the sky in a southerly fashion, okay? It's always kind of over there. If you're planting your tall plants, for instance, on the southern side of your garden, as the sun crosses the sky, it's going to cast a shadow on any short plants that are behind those tall guys, okay? To remedy that, plant always plant your tallest plants, okay? In a vegetable garden, that's like sunflowers and tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, like tall things. Corn, don't get me started on corn in Florida, but corn would be a good example of a tall plant. Those go on your northern side, Okay, so there's no potential for them to shade any of the short crops on the southern side. Again, this isn't an ideal situation. Sometimes you can't help it and you have to go east to west. And in east to west, it's less important, but you should still try and group your tall plants with each other and your short plants away from them. Always to reduce shading because shading reduces production potential and that means you get less radishes, for instance. Intercropping is another technique you might consider as well. So this is a nice way to be very efficient with your land, especially if you have a very small garden or plot that you're growing in. Um, it's the practice of growing several species within the same space. And there's two kinds. There's mixed intercropping, which is literally in the same row. So we'll use one row as an example. You have corn, beans, and squash and tomatoes all in one row, okay? That's mixed intercropping. There's also row intercropping, which is like this picture. So if you look at this picture, you can see that there's corn, there looks like there's some beans, likely soybeans, and then there looks like there's some peas, okay? So we have one, two, three, and then corn again. So they're all planted in the same space, 
but they're not in the same row, okay? Both methods are valid and both methods are really dependent on how much space you have. So if you have a premium on space, very limited capacity, mixed intercropping is appropriate because you can plant all of those plants in the same row. Again, keeping in mind that tall guys should go away from the short ones, okay? But if you have a more expansive space or a larger garden, you can use mixed intercropping and that makes your use, uh, your land use more efficient. So you're getting more bang for your buck. You're, you're harvesting more food from that square footage than you would have if you just planted it with just corn, for instance. Um, they can be used and there, there is some research for it, but I'm not going to say that it's been proven yet, but there is some research that's suggesting that these uh, strategies can help to reduce some pest pressure because of the mixed environment. So instead of a monoculture of plants, there's a polyculture or many plants growing together and they are either masking potential hosts or they are antagonizing some of the insects. Um, there's, there's different research on that right now, but, but it could be used to help manage some pest pressure. So that's intercropping. Succession planting is very useful. However, it's very planning intensive. And if you're just starting garden or you, <laughs> you're not a patient person, nor do you care to plan, succession planting could be a very difficult concept for you. Um, what, what it is in a nutshell, is planting every week or two weeks, okay? So instead of planting your whole garden at once, you have a staggered planting. And so we'll use uh, lettuce, for instance, because this is a really good one to use succession planting for. So you start one row of lettuce this week, okay? Next week, you let it grow. You start to see some sprouts coming up. The, the week after, so two weeks later, after our initial planting, we plant a second row of lettuce. And then we repeat that pattern throughout our lettuce block. So by the time we get to our fourth or fifth row, the lettuce that we planted initially, that first crop is almost ready to harvest, okay? So we harvest them, we eat them those weeks, and then the next week, the next lettuce row is ready, and then the following and the following and the following. So there's a succession. So you're always getting something. And it sounds really nice and ideal. <laughs> it's, again, planning intensive. Be prepared. Get a notebook. Make sure you're writing down when you're planting things, and make sure you have a plan before you start planting, OK? <laughs> Super helpful skill. I just want y'all to be prepared. I know it's like, eh, I got it now. Okay, when you go to do this, be prepared. Okay, so succession planting can be used on many species, but it's very useful on our leafy crops. So like spinaches, um, you get lettuces, some beans even, bush beans are very good at these as well. That way you can extend your harvest. We have some cover crops, uh, our next technique. And that will be that will be definitely um, something to consider if you if you have the space. If you have a larger garden, it makes more sense. Um, it can be done in smaller settings. In fact, we've tried it this year at our county community garden. We've done cover crops in a in a traditional raised garden, um, and they've worked very well. The purpose of a cover crop is to cover the soil. I mean, science is super creative with its names, and cover crop really. It's, they're intended to cover. They're a living mulch, okay, if that makes sense to you. Looking at this picture, you can see that this is a cover crop, crop of red clover, okay? This whole field is planted in red clover when it's not being used to produce a cash crop. So a cash crop in, in our context would be like your tomatoes or your squashes, things that you're desiring, that you're wanting to eat. So when you're not growing those, and you don't feel like growing other vegetables, you could put down a cover crop to create a living mulch on your soil, okay? That helps to preserve the quality of the soil so it's not exposed to the sun. It helps to improve the biological diversity of the soil you have because as those plants are growing, they are exuding sugars from their roots and those sugars are feeding all the beneficial bacteria and fungi that live within the soil. 
And then we also have the added benefit of chopping them up afterwards. So once it's time to plant your cash crop or, or your desired plants, chopping up those cover crops and then incorporating them back into the soil is going to add some organic matter. And so they have the, that three-pronged benefit. Um, I strongly encourage them. However, the practicality of that in a smaller garden can be eh. So just keep that in mind, but several species can be used depending on the season. So in the summertime, which is primarily when you might use a cover crop in Florida, okay? Some people just really do not want to garden when it's hot out, but instead of leaving your garden bare or full of weeds, why not plant a cover crop of black eyed peas, for instance, or sorghum, okay? Or velvet bean or sesame or sunflowers. There can be really beautiful cover crops that are still serving that vital purpose of covering the soil and then being incorporated back into it when it's time to plant your favorite crops. If you want to do one in the winter time, you can use like ryegrass. There's, um, goodness, annual rye, there's wheat rye, there's triticale, there's, uh, oh gosh, that one's forgetting me, buckwheat. You can use buckwheat too, so, and that one's edible. So those can be grown in the cool season. Um, but cover crops, again, should be part of your maintenance in your garden if, if you can do it, if you can manage it. A little bit about tomatoes, and I won't delve into too much about them because I will be teaching a course shortly on tomatoes because it's time, it's that time of year. Um, couple things to keep in mind when you're buying transplants, tomato transplants from the store, or you've grown them yourself, we plant tomatoes deep, quote unquote deep, or sideways, okay? What you're gonna do, I'm like looking around like I got a tomato here. <laughs> what you would do is uh, you find your tomato transplant where the first two little baby leaves are, you're gonna pinch those off, and then you're gonna plant the tomato about that deep. So it's usually two to three inches deeper than you would normally plant a vegetable or any plant for that matter. For other vegetables, it's not appropriate, okay? Do not plant them very deep. You will have really poor results, okay? For a tomato though, that stem that's in contact with the soil is going to produce a more extensive root system. And so you'll have a more stable, more productive plant, okay? If you don't wanna plant them deeply, you can create a little trench lay them on their side and do the same thing, cover that stem. It'll do the same thing, okay? So sideways or deep, that's how we plant tomato seedlings, okay? Doesn't matter what type of variety you have, be it indeterminate or determinate or non-determinate, whatever, they must be staked. I mean, that's just one of the best practices you can do for tomatoes. Yes, they can grow without them. However, they are more productive, they're more secure, when they are staked. In particular, those varieties that are determined to be crazy, like your cherries, okay? They're indeterminate varieties. They just keep growing and growing and growing. They need to be staked to keep them off of the ground and to keep them at their most productive. Again, in these vegetable gardens, you're going for production. I'm using that term a lot, but that's your goal. You wanna eat this stuff, right? In your mind, you're planting this garden, not just to go outside and have some stress relief, but also to kind of supplement your diet a little bit. And so you want these plants to be productive. One thing that can be a little contentious about <laughs> tomatoes is, is the pruning of suckers. That really comes down to the grower. Um, <laughs> that's your preference. If you really feel like going out there and pruning suckers, it can be advantageous for indeterminate varieties like cherry tomatoes because it helps to improve their structure and their ease of care. So it makes them less unruly, if you will. Uh, on a determinate variety, which are the ones that kind of stay short and squat, pruning suckers is really unnecessary because you want as many branches on those ones as possible for fruit set. Now, pruning the suckers can also improve the quality of those fruits though. So if you are taking them off, you're likely to have bigger, more flavorful tomatoes, but not necessarily more, okay? So really it goes down to your preference as a gardener. And if you only have like one or two cherry tomatoes, 
pruning suckers is probably something you could manage. If you have a whole block in your garden, maybe not. And so we're gonna summarize and then I have a couple minutes I think for questions. So gardens thrive on consistency as, as do all things in life. I mean, if you're consistent with it, you stick with it, you have a schedule with it. I mean, those are some of the major keys to success here. Watering consistently. If you're hand watering, that's three to four times a week. If you're using an irrigation system, that's getting at least an inch a week um, during the growing season for your vegetables. Fertilizing consistently, be it organic or conventional, it doesn't matter. You just wanna read that label on the back of that fertilizer product that you've purchased. That's going to give you the application instructions and frequency. And then of course, scouting, which is looking at pests. And we're, we'll leave that for Kathy to cover next week. Um, that's just gonna be part of your normal garden maintenance is just going through looking and making sure that there are no pests. You wanna keep your vegetable garden clean and free of weeds. And I talked about why, because they have the potential to harbor diseases and pests, okay? When they're alive and when they're dead. So they need to be removed and then disposed of. And then there are, are some techniques that will help improve your gardening experience like succession planting. It makes you more productive. However, it requires more time and planning. Intercropping is also one of those strategies which will help you in being more efficient in your gardens. But otherwise, that's all I have for y'all today on garden maintenance. Uh, I don't know how y'all wanna do these question things, but we'll open the floor if anyone has any. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and Go back to the main slide. Thank if you, you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A. And we do have a few questions there already, Mac. Okay, let's see. Do all cover crops mentioned grow in Florida? Yes, in this, in this slide and the ones that I talked about, yes. Now they are, it depends on their season. Um, so in the summertime, the black eyed peas would be appropriate. Sun hemp is a new one that would be appropriate. It's not the same as hemp hemp, it's a different plant. Um, you can use sorghum, which doubles up as a grain in the summertime. You can use some um, obscure ones like velvet bean. Those are very good for hot, humid, wet times of the year. In the cooler times, you're going to focus more on the grasses. And so you could do um, those those different types of rye or barley grasses. Um, you could do buckwheat, you could do Austrian winter pea is another one you can throw down um, as long as it's cool. Once it starts to heat back up, those plants will, will, will perish, but that's their purpose really is to be incorporated into it. Um, uh, next question is about incorporating biochar into the garden. That is something that I would have to do more research on, unfortunately. I don't have a lot of experience using biochar in the garden. I have heard good things about it. Um, one thing that I know you should watch out for is if you're using fertilizers that have a, a salty component or have high salts, most of your conventional ones will, those salts tend to be attracted to those, those biochar uh, clumps. So yeah, I'd have to do a little more research to really um, to answer that one accurately, though. I'm sorry about that. Uh, next question is, treat early blight on tomatoes and prevent it. <laughs> so treating, uh, we'll start with first with resistance, okay? So when you're planting tomatoes, if you've experienced and you know for a fact you've been dealing with the early blight in your area, Finding a variety of tomatoes that is resistant to early blight is step one. Now know that resistance does not imply immunity. Okay, so they will still, if it's present and you've, there's been no management around it in the past, it will likely show up on these plants as well. However, with their resistance, they will be able to provide fruits to you. And so they can, they can tolerate the pressure for a while. Um, past varietal selection, Early applications of copper fungicide, if you scout it early enough, can be useful in helping to manage it. But we'll emphasize the word manage. There will be no control. Um, it's just if the conditions are favorable for it, 
and you don't have resistance to it, you lose the crop or it's severely damaged. If you have resistance to it, you've scouted it early and you've treated with copper fungicides, your chances are better for a harvest. Know that it's always a race of time though. So if you could find an early maturing, early blight resistant tomato, your chances are much better in that race because that's what it is, is you wanna try and beat the disease progression. Um, the longer those tomato fruits sit on the plant, the longer that plant has to be in that situation and the more likely it is to become infected. Um, next question is tips on container vegetable gardening. I love container vegetable gardening. It's super useful because uh, you can control the quality of everything in that. Um, Really start off with a good quality potting soil. Don't go the route of purchasing garden soil for a, for a container, okay? Garden soil is made to be put in the ground as kind of like a soil conditioner and a mimic. In a pot or a container, you, you should be using potting soil because it drains better. It's not as heavy. Um, so start with a good quality um, potting soil. With container plants, you have to fertilize. Okay, there has to be some type of fertilization. And again, it can be conventional, it can be organic, but it must be done in this situation because there's no natural inputs. Okay, there was no natural reservoir of nutrition in that. Once those plants take out, let's say you're using the miracle Grow is probably the one you'll run into. Once they use all that fertilizer in that soil and it's not been replenished, then those plants begin to starve. And so watering and Fertilization are very crucial for container gardening. Um, are there a lot of problems with animals eating crops in the veggie garden? Not in my experience, not in a community garden setting. No, we don't typically have um, mammals or anything coming in. We do have fences. There will be the occasional rabbit or duck that might come in depending on the garden. Typically it's insect pests or invertebrates that are causing the issues. Um, and those can be remedied through IPM or integrated pest management strategies, which Kathy will talk about next week. How many crops of tomatoes can be planted per year? I say two. Um, I don't like to plant them back to back, however, because they tend to be very disease prone. I don't recommend ever planting tomatoes in the summertime if you can help it, okay? just. Avoid that at all costs. In theory, yes, it can be done. However, your opportunities for diseases and pests are magnified, so why? <laughs> um, fall is ideal. So late August, early September to January, or December, I'm sorry, that would be one of the growing seasons. And then in December, you would pull them out like an annual plant and get rid of them. Or you could plant in January or February, depending on how cold it is where you are, and plant those and grow them until late April, early May, depending on the year, and then remove them before summer comes. The next is, do I know what varieties are resistant? I have several in my little head here, but it would be more helpful if I knew the type of disease you were looking for. Um, the internet is wonderful for that purpose, if you're looking for seeds or transplants for that matter, and you know that you've been dealing with a particular disease. So you can shop for resistance, especially on tomatoes because we've been selecting them for so long because they're so popular. There's a lot of disease resistant varieties out there. Some of them have resistances to diseases that we don't have here in Florida. Um, so you do wanna pay attention to the variety and where it was developed. Um, but yeah, it would really depend on the particular disease. Um, when is the best time of year to plant tomatoes? I like to plant them in now, <laughs> mid-September, and then grow them until about December, around Christmas, and then I pull them out. Um, you can also grow them in, in February too. So late January, early February, you can start them. And again, that would be the second tomato season. So those are the two most ideal times for tomato cultivation in our region. The Everglades tomato in the summer, yeah, it'll perform well. Know that um, it is susceptible to the same diseases, though it might be resistant to them or they might be less impactful. However, if you're growing Everglades tomatoes in the summertime and then you want to grow 
regular tomatoes in the fall, you've created an environment where those diseases and pests have had a food source or a host the entire summer. And then when you change from Everglades tomato to a, the other types of tomatoes, which are typically less resistant to diseases and pests, you start to see issues. And so if you're going to grow tomatoes, my advice to you is to pick one season that you prefer. If you like Everglades tomatoes, and we'll use that because it's in the question, and you want to grow them in the summer, so be it. Grow them in the summertime, skip the fall. Okay, then plant them again in February. Okay, so you would plant more tomatoes in February. Give your garden a break, rotate them out, if you will. Tomato resistance to early blight. There is one called Neptune, there's Tropic VFN, there are, there's a couple. So there's several companies to look for for disease varieties. Um, you can look at Southern Exposure Seeds. You can look at Baker Creek Heirlooms. There's um, Seed Savers Exchange is another one. Those are all really nice sites to look for heirloom varieties that are resistant. You can also look in a burpee catalog too and look for any hybrids that might have that as well. But those are the ones that jump to my head. Tropic VFN is one variety that's very resistant to a lot of things. Um, however, the taste of it is not, it's not so great. So yeah, you get tomatoes, but they're kind of grainy and taste less. Um, what size container should be used for cherry tomatoes? I like to containers size them up as they grow. So I start them off in a four inch pot as a seedling. Then they're transferred into a one gallon pot to a three gallon pot. And then ultimately they live in a seven gallon pot. They can go a little bigger than that, but they're not gonna grow that long for me. So a seven gallon pot is typically how big uh, of a container I'll use for cherry tomatoes. And then just remember to make sure your watering is very frequent in a container, especially when it's warm out because th those tend to dry out faster. Um, and then make sure you're fertilizing consistently as well. With tomatoes, you always wanna have a nice fertilizer regime to where you're consistent and that fertilizer has a calcium component, okay? So a lot of gardeners like to throw in eggshells into their gardens and that's perfectly fine. Know that that calcium takes a long time to become available. And so make sure the fertilizer you're using has a calcium component that is readily available to the plants. Okay, there's liquid fertilizers that contain calcium and there are granular fertilizers that also contain calcium. But for tomatoes in particular, to prevent blossom end rot, which is really common, you wanna have that calcium component and your watering should be consistent. So if there's no more questions, I think, yeah, I think we're good. We're right on the money as far as time goes. Thank you very much, Mac. That was great information. And I did post the link to our YouTube channel in the chat and in the Q&A. So if anyone is interested in going back and seeing past recordings, uh, you can uh, check that link out. And also, I hope you'll join us next week for the third part of our vegetable webinar series. It will be scouting for insects and diseases, as Mac mentioned. Thank you all very much for joining us and uh, we hope to see you next week as well. <laughs>